Hi, I'm Jeremy Green, and along with my colleague Bridget Gertler, I'm happy to welcome you to Survey 3, Science and the Practice of Medicine. I'm standing here in the Jacobs Room of the Institute of the History of Medicine, named after Henry Barton Jacobs, a physician who joined the faculty of this institution just a few years after it opened its doors in 1893. The opening of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine has been celebrated as a moment in which scientific methods entered the training of medical personnel in the United States. But Jacobs, along with his contemporaries in the faculty of this institution, knew that the opening of this school was only one of many different moments in which medicine became modern in different ways. The windows of this room form a quasi-religious iconography of some of these moments. On the one hand, we see a celebration of the emergence of bacteriology and immunology at the hands of Louis Pasteur in the late 19th century. And on the other, we see Edward Jenner's discovery of the principles of vaccination much earlier in the 18th century. So reflecting on these moments, one is left to wonder what exactly do we speak of when we speak of modern medicine? Here we have a copy of uh, the treatise on scurvy by the Scottish physician James Lind, written in the 18th century, widely celebrated as a early moment in the history of the randomized clinical trial. Yet Lind himself would not have understood his work in that way at all. And indeed, when we look more closely at Lind's writings, he understood scurvy in terms of an imbalance of the four humors, a very different model than the vitamin deficiency model that would be proposed centuries later. Jacob's collection also details the work of the early 19th century physicians of the Paris school, such as René Théophile Hyacinthe Flanec, whose newly invented diagnostic tool, the stethoscope, revolutionized the diagnosis of specific lesions by physical exam. And his description of these lesions bears a striking kinship to the way that we would describe a condition like pulmonary tuberculosis or emphysema today. But though Lenec and others of the Paris School helped to define a modern and more complex diagnostic practice, their therapeutics seem archaic by today's standards, with heavy emphasis on diet, regimen, and bloodletting. I love teaching classes in the Jacobs Room. It is a warm space designed to create an intimate place for reflecting on the role of the past in engaging with practice of modern medicine today. This course, too, is designed to produce an intimate space no more than 15 students per class, in which we can grapple with the role of historical analysis in the present world. But this course will be taught outside of the confines of this room. I mean this literally. On the one hand, you as students may be scattered across the globe as far as where you're actually taking this course from. But I also mean this in a broader sense. The goal of this course is not to restrict ourselves to the books on these walls or to the stories of the great doctors celebrated in these stained glass windows, but to look in a more broader sense at the nature of healing and illness at different points in time. Nor is this a course about how we got to be so smart in comparison with people of previous times. Rather, I want to encourage you to use this course to think seriously about the very different ways in which people lived with health and illness in different moments in time. So, for example, we will be studying the changing epidemiology and social meanings of disease. For example, how epidemic diseases like smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera were understood, and the different kinds of institutions that were produced as people tried to organize responses to these and other threats to health. Much of this work was not done by doctors at all, but by sanitary workers, nurses, midwives, secular healers, and everyday citizens in the context of their homes. Over the next eight weeks, we will be using the tools of social, intellectual, and cultural history to interrogate the science and practice of medicine in the 18th and 19th centuries. For those of you interested in continuing these sets of questions on into the present day, this will continue in the fourth part of our four-part survey course in the history of medicine. But this course will end well before my own institution, Johns Hopkins, was founded. Thank you.